This looks like I, I produce a series called Green Energy Futures, and this room reminds me of my series because if I look at my YouTube uh, views, it's 80% men. Where the hell are all the women? That's what I want to, I know there's a few of you in here, but where are they? Uh, and how do we reach them with this stuff? It's ironic because if you look at the statistics for who advocates for renewable energy and clean energy, women advocate more than men. So, go figure. Um, my community league is Evansdale. I've been involved there for about 20 years. It's in the north end of the city. We encompass three neighborhoods, so Bell Reeve, uh, Evans, Old Evansdale, which is a 40-year-old neighborhood, Bell Reeve, which is a 20-year-old neighborhood, uh, and Eau Claire, which is a little younger than Bell Reeve. Actually, Evansdale is probably more like 50 years old now or 55 years old. And so we have a, a big hall, and we decided we wanted to get involved with this quite some time ago, but the inspiration really came from the EFCL. Uh, when I was president of the EFCL, we came up with this program, a pilot program for solar for community leagues. And uh, we put a bit of money into the pot and we said, if you guys pony up some money, uh, we will uh, give you a solar system, a comprehensive energy audit, and a LED monitor to promote your programs and uh, share your energy production uh, in your hall. The program was so successful. I designed this program selfishly because I wanted a solar system on my hall. And, but the problem was it was so successful, about 18 leagues applied to get in the draw for the program. We only had money for seven and uh, I couldn't rig the process, so I didn't win. So, <laughs> so best laid plans uh, didn't work. Turned out better for us in the long run. Uh, so those are the leagues that actually were successful. Uh, Metal Arc, Glenora, uh, North Glenora, Albert Avenue, reading from bottom to top, uh, Sherwood, Ritchie, West, Jasper, Riverdale, Rossdale. And the FCL actually put a system on the roof of this building as well. I'm kind of glad I, we didn't participate in the program because those were actually demonstration scales, so they're about 1.2 kilowatts. They're very small systems, uh, which at the time seemed like a good idea, and we had limited funds anyways. But what we did, this is our hall in North Edmonton. If you look on Google, uh, Gordon Howell, who we had do our work, looked on Google at our hall, and he went, oh my gosh. <laughs> that is a giant south-facing roof on our hall, so it's literally the perfect circumstance uh, for a solar system. So we had uh, Gordon Howell design the system. He's a solar advocate who goes back to the 1970s. That's when he put solar on his own roof in his home. Uh, and now he's uh, crazy busy installing solar systems around the city. So he did our plan. And even in the beginning, we had money to do a 13 and a half kilowatt system uh, that we had raised. Uh, and even in the beginning, this is his planning document. He planned for a second half. So even in our original drawings, we were ambitious about this. So we did put 13 kilowatts. Uh, on the hall, 13.6 kilowatt system. Uh, it costs us $43,000, so that's about $3.20 a watt. Uh, this will provide us with electricity for about 30 years. We estimate that's about half of our electricity demand, that 13 kilowatt system. Uh, how did we fund it? We used a City of Edmonton CLIP program, that's a community league infrastructure program, uh, and we used CFEP, which is the provincial infrastructure program for community facilities, uh, and we used, did our own fundraising. But, and here's the big but, this was part of a much bigger project. So we didn't apply to the city to their traditional infrastructure programs and say fund our solar. We funded to them, we applied to them and we said we're building a sports facility, we're building a new rink, we're, build, we're paving some asphalt, we're making basketball courts. Uh, and by the way, we're going to put solar on our roof and we're going to put LED lights uh, in our rink. So it was part of a bigger proposal and they, uh, we were very careful when we applied for it to get uh, sustainability support and say, oh, that's a really visionary thing to do because we didn't want to screw it up for you guys who might apply for money later on to do this kind of thing. So uh, we wanted to make sure it was accepted at the time. And I think part of the reason was it was part of a bigger project. Uh, community solar benefits. I really see solar as an investment in community. It's one of the few infrastructure investments that we do in our communities that aren't just future liabilities. You know, when you, you build a hockey rink, it's actually a future liability. It starts depreciating the first day you build it, and your next thing you know, you're repairing it, and your asphalt's falling apart, and you've got to raise more money. Well, this one, uh, it does depreciate over time, but it also pays dividend. So it pays part of our utility bill every month for the next 30 years and even beyond that theoretically. So it's one of those really cool infrastructure investments that makes your community league more resilient, uh, more able to do programs. So what do you do with those savings? You spend them on programs. You spend them on soccer. You spend it on whatever the community leagues do. It's, it's all good, whatever you do with the money, right? 
Um, so it, it's, it's kind of cool because it's a visible, very progressive project. It attracts a lot of attention in your neighborhood, and it has in ours. And in fact, it attracted community leagues from all over the place to come and have a look at it, and has inspired uh, six other leagues in our area to actively seek proposals to do it on their halls as well. So that's pretty cool. Uh, and it's, um, we also, as part of this project, as I said, we did LED lights for our rink. This was about, a, I think it was about a $48,000 project. We installed 16 LED uh, uh, rink lights, so all we did was replace the heads. We didn't actually put new posts up and stuff, and uh, really, really happy with these. Like, they're super energy efficient. They're about 65% more efficient than the lights they replaced, uh, and the light is better. It's really awesome. Uh, people are very happy with this. We actually used a couple of those as well in our, in our parking lot, which had no lighting. Uh, in the past. Unfortunately, uh, in terms of energy savings, yes, we're saving 65% on the rink, but we didn't have lights in the parking lot before. <laughs> and those lights are on every night when it's dark, and so we were losing some of our savings to lighting our parking lot, which we needed to do anyways. Um, so this year, our, uh, our solar provider, actually the guy who did the work for us, phoned me up and said, can I fill out an EcoCity application for the other half of your solar system? And I, to which I said, okay. <laughs> and EcoCity is a small program done by the city, by the city with, who's the other partner? Uh, Alberta Research Labs. Alberta. Okay. And so uh, I was on the board for that the year before the, uh, approving the grants. And so I resigned because I knew we were going to apply. Uh, and they kept sending me the materials. <laughs> and I said, no, I'm going to apply. And so we did. So we're successful this year in raising 75% uh, of the money we needed for the second half of the system. Uh, through that, plus we'll get money from the municipal uh, climate change action, the municipal fund for for uh, solar. Um, this will finish covering our roof. The system will be 25 kilowatts when it's done, and that'll theoretically make us net zero on electricity. It'll, it'll provide the equivalent of 100% of our electricity. Although, uh, ironically, it'll provide that electricity at exactly the time of the year we don't need it uh, in the summertime because uh, we have our rink lights and stuff on and our parking lot lights and our hall lights uh, are all on in the wintertime, obviously, a lot more than they're on in the summertime. But thanks to microgen, we export in the summer and we buy back electricity in the winter. It's not the optimal situation, but it works. And I think... So why is it not optimal? Well, because you pay more to buy electricity back. So when you use your own self-generated electricity, uh, you save the cost of buying that electricity. So when you buy the electricity, it's not just six cents a kilowatt hour or eight cents or whatever number you pay, it's that number plus distribution. So we sell our electricity at the rate we pay. That's how microgeneration works. So let's say our contract for the sake of argument is six cents a kilowatt hour. So we pay six cents to get electricity. They pay us six cents uh, when we export it back to the grid. But the problem is when we buy it back, we have to pay the distribution charges. So that's an extra roughly four cents. So you're spending another four cents a kilowatt hour to buy it back. So you lose a little bit in the transaction. Uh, our next project is a lighting retrofit in the hall, uh, adding uh, vendor misers and, and a variety of other things in the hall. And we'll just make that uh, our, as part of our next CLIP application uh, next spring. So, Community leagues are always doing projects, and as long as CLIP money is available, you should be updating stuff that needs to be updated in your league anyways, and we'll just pile this on to our, to our next project. We have ancient lighting systems in here. Those are T12 lights. Uh, it's terrible. Like an auditor, a uh, friend of mine, when he, wa he walked in, he looked around, he just laughed. He said, this is, this is almost easy uh, because we have so much old stuff uh, in the hall. And I won't talk about that, right? That's it. We really should uh, maybe give David a hand too. He was the one that really came up with the idea that EFCL should put this proposal together for a sustainability staff person too. So I, I feel like we owe him a, a bit of a hand for that too. <laughs> So before we get into talking about the actual um, grant funding that are available for, for leagues, I thought um, it might be nice to talk a little bit about some of the things that make grant applications successful. I think one of the first points is about having a compelling story. The applications that we get for EcoCity are not just infrastructure related applications. Um, people can ask for funding for education related things too. 
and even um, I'll pass out some of the CLIP grant applications later. You can see, um, I think the foundation is to be able to talk about why you want to do this in the first place. Why is it important for your league? What are some of the um, social, environmental, economic impacts that you're looking to find from it? But also um, in a way that tells a bit of a story. I think um, David's real strength is that he is a, a storyteller by trade. So when we reviewed his application, the grant committee said, wow, this is such a great story because it was written in that sort of nice narrative kind of form and told us about what they were trying to achieve and why it was important. Um, I guess my second point, we'll be talking about a few City of Edmonton grants tonight. And when we're reviewing those applications, um, the communities that are able to tie their application back to city policy also seem to do very well. And someone, um, that's where someone like Rocky really excelled. She was picking out um, different goals from the energy transition strategy and putting them in her application and tying them directly to how their community league actions were actually gonna help the city meet its goals. And those are some of the explicit questions that are even asked. So it's good to be a little bit familiar with those. After this workshop, I'm gonna send um, some links to things like the energy transition strategy but there's also, the city also has a bunch of other strategic plans. One of them is called The Way We Live, and it's the one that usually governs things around community leagues as well, too. So it's good to be familiar with that. But again, linking your proposal at your small league and in your neighborhood to sort of larger societal change, too, and how you're interested in being a community leader. Um, and I guess the last point is always apply for more funds than you need. Uh, Tonight we'll be talking about a bunch of different funding programs that only provide a portion of what you need for any given project. So over the course of writing your applications for solar and energy efficiency projects, you might be applying to four different funders to actually put all of the different pieces together. I would say, um, you know, see if there's a fifth or a sixth one that you can apply to too, because that way if you're denied funding from one of the groups, you still have a little bit of a backstop too. So um, with EcoCity Edmonton, we require 20% uh, matching funds. So we will fund up to 80% of a given project. But when Mark talks, he's gonna tell us about some funds that you know, will only fund more like 20% of project costs. So again, um, in my previous life, I used to work as a sustainability coordinator for a neighborhood in Winnipeg, actually, and this was a, at least half of my job was writing funding applications. And I would say we were probably successful in about 50% of the things that we applied for. And as far as my boss was concerned, we were doing great because a lot of the funds that we're gonna talk about are highly competitive and a lot of them aren't. So we've kind of chosen a bit of a balance with the different things we'll be talking about today in that regard too. Okay, so some other points. Um, the City of Edmonton City Council decided a little while ago that grants that are specifically from the City of Edmonton can't be stacked. So you can't apply for two different funding um, programs that the city has and put them in the same application. Again, we already talked about uh, many grants only cover a percentage of eligible costs. And not only of, um, when you're looking at eligible costs, also look at um, the eligible sort of materials and line items. So some things will cover things like project management costs. Other funds will only cover things that are very material based. So something like CLIP will cover project management costs, but they wouldn't, uh, they do have some exceptions to things that they're not interested in funding. The things that we at EcoCity like to fund like if you have a consultant that's coming to deliver some educational programming for your neighborhood. Um, also keep in mind how many quotes are required for each funder. Nora is gonna talk about a, a program a little bit later where they actually have um, a requirement that you get more than one contractor in. So that means after uh, you have your solar site assessment and your energy audit and you're getting ready to the point where you wanna hire contractors, you might actually have to talk to a few of them to get quotes, which of course is always a best practice um, to have at least three. But sometimes um, we're anticipating in January that this sector will become really busy because that's when some incentive programs from the provincial government are supposed to become available and we'll talk a little bit about them later. 
So also, um, you know, talking to those contractors as quickly as you can, I think before next year will also be an important, uh, an important thing to consider. Oh, why is this doing this? Sorry, Mark, my apologies if this is gonna... Okay. So I'm gonna pass it off to Mark now. Okay, so hi everyone. My name is Mark Huot. I'm here from the Municipal Climate Change Action Center. A really, really long name. Uh, MCCAC is what we call ourselves usually. We are a, um, a government-funded partnership between four organizations. So they all have acronyms up there, but the AUMA and AMDNC are organizations that represent municipalities across Alberta. So the AUMA is the urban municipalities, and the AMDNC are the um, associate the districts and counties and uh, some small towns as well. So those two organizations plus Alberta Environment and Parks and then the Department of Municipal Affairs as well make up our, our collective uh, organization and governance. And then we receive money from Environment and Parks to offer programs to help municipalities across Alberta with energy efficiency and renewable energy and just in general on climate change. Um, so we, we do a variety of different things. We're probably most known for our money because that's what people usually like from us. We do have programs that municipalities can access to help fund different types of projects. Um, but uh, as far as hours go, a lot of what we do is providing technical assistance to help them through the different projects. Uh, we're, we're not affiliated with any company and we're a non-profit as an organization. So we're a good resource to help them in a pretty non-biased way to move through, select the best contractors, to come up with the best projects, and really to help them at every stage along the way. Uh, we also do education outreach and webinars, um, most of it being pretty focused at municipal staff. But the reason I'm here today is that in the case of our two programs for efficiency and renewable energy, they also apply to nonprofit community related organizations. So the, the most common with that being community leagues. Uh, if there's a museum in a municipality and it's on municipally owned land, um, that would also be eligible for our funding. And so we do also help a variety of different other types of organizations. And so I wanted to come today to talk about our funding because it, it would definitely be eligible uh, to projects that you might have going forward. So uh, since the NDP got in, we've been pretty fortunate. We went from a budget of $2 million when we were originally founded in 2009. We had that for a few years. And then we received $4 million for efficiency and another $5 million for solar. So we went from $2 million over three years to having $9 million in one, which is pretty fantastic. So with that, we've been launching some pretty interesting programs. And um, the first one, oh, of course, it's going to have all these headers and stuff. The temp if you can ignore that. <laughs> um, so this, the first program we have is called TAME Plus. It, it originated from an old program called Taking Action to Manage Energy, which was a mouthful, and it was called TAME back then. And when we got the new money, we relaunched it and improved it and made it quite a bit bigger. So we called it TAME Plus to uh, kind of be a nod or tip of the hat to the old program and also keep us some of the branding. So this is a program that really covers anything when it comes to energy efficiency. So it, it's what we call a custom program. So we take a building, um, when someone's interested in going through a program with it, they complete an audit, and the audit goes through and systematically looks at where all the energy is being used, and it comes up with recommendations on the most cost-effective types of improvements you can make in that building. And basically anything that can be demonstrated to have energy savings is potentially eligible through this program. Uh, the only exception being solar because we now have a solar program. So that might cover things relating to mechanical systems. So the HVAC, boilers, heaters, vents, pumps, all those really fun things in the hidden room in the back. It would cover electrical systems, most commonly lighting, um, but also if there's motion sensors or occupancy sensors in buildings, it can cover an envelope, which is just a fancy way of saying insulation, uh, for walls or roofs or uh, weather stripping, which is the most boring and yet the most cost effective by far of measures that you could do. It's usually about $5 and very easy to do yourself. Um, and then other types of energy systems. So we've seen some cogeneration systems. So that's where you're putting in, in some cases, something like a, an engine 
in your car that burns natural gas, and it produces electricity and heat at the same time. Um, so we've had programs do that. Solar thermal would be another example. Um, technically, geothermal would be eligible, but we, we haven't had any of those go through just yet. So basically, a, a pretty wide range of things. Um, then the way the program works as far as money goes is we, um, and this, this, again, you have to imagine it's sort of designed for a municipal building, like an arena or something. We would look at the size of the building, and that puts uh, the applicant into a tier. And so the bigger the building is, the more money they're eligible for. And we have four tiers. So the smallest category can get up to $25,000. The biggest category can get up to $100,000. And the way the program works is it basically covers 50% of the cost of the project. So we, we do have a list online of all the different eligible measures, but it's the measures um, like the cost associated with buying the equipment, installing the equipment. If there's engineering or design required, that would be an eligible expense as well. Some things that aren't included are you know paying yourself to apply for the project and um, the energy audit. We have a rebate for the audit, which you can see there as well, $500 to $2,000, again, based on the size of the building. That's a flat rate, so we don't look at the cost of the audit. We just give you that straight up. Um, the, the, probably the only real difference here is that technically municipalities with our program are only supposed to apply once, and that's so we can get more participants across Alberta. So in the case of community leagues, what we would do is wait till there's a couple of you that are all going forward at the same time and bundle you as one project. And hopefully with that, we would, we would just basically add up the size of all your buildings and treat you as though you were one super building. And so that would determine what category you're in. And then when the projects are done, we look at all the costs and pull it all together and then calculate the rebate. Oh. Um, yeah, uh, so with this one, it's a first come, first serve program, and we have three years to deliver it. We launched it in November of last year, so we still technically have two and a half years left. It goes until then or until we run out of money, and we're maybe about one third in, so there's, there's still quite a bit of room for more projects to come on board. And so it's not a huge panic, but it's, um, it's probably not something you'd want to wait forever. And when I was talking with Robin, I, I think what we would do is we would probably start with those projects that are moving forward in the near future, group them all into one, and then hopefully by the time another batch is ready, we can change the rules a little bit so we can have another wave go through. We, we usually come up with that rule to try to spread it around, and with our old program, what we did is we gave everybody a, a year and a half head start, and after that, we took away the limits. And so that would kind of put us around a similar time that by that point, we say, okay, Everyone who wanted to apply has had a chance. Let's now open it up to people who can do more work. And so that way we could ideally get a couple of batches through until, you know, until the funding is used up. OK, so how to participate in this program. There are five main steps, which sounds complicated, but we've done our best to make them as easy as possible. The very first is to submit what we call an expression of interest. Um, that's a non-committal stage where you're basically telling us you're interested in it, and you're giving us some very basic information so that we can help you move through the project. It's an online form where we ask really hard questions like, what's your name, what's your building, and what's your address? Um, and then the slightly harder information of asking you what your energy bill was the previous year. So we ask how much electricity and how much gas you used over a 12-month period. The reason we ask that is you can't, I don't know if I can jump that, yeah. Uh, the online form that you apply for actually fills out and automatically generates a benchmark for the building too. Um, a benchmark being it compares your building to our database that we've been building of over 600 buildings. And we look at a similar Alberta collection of community centers and show you how your building does compared to all of those. So it's, um, it's your expression of interest, but it's also some pretty valuable information. It might help you with some of the other grants you have to write. So you could show on there if your uh, you know, if your building's older and not performing very well, that can be a really good rationale for why you should do efficiency programs. And it, it calculates with generic energy prices uh, an example of how your, your savings might be if you were to perform as compared to the best in class. So we find the best building that's similar to yours and show you if you saved as much energy as they did, this is how much, uh, how much money and how much greenhouse gases you would save per year. It's not saying you can necessarily 
get exactly that, but it's a good example. Uh, so sub expression of interest is done. And then the next step that we require is a, a detailed energy assessment, otherwise known as an energy audit. And it sounds like that's already a part of what you're doing anyway. Um, so with municipalities, they don't always love that step because it's, it's sometimes expensive and they have to go and hire somebody to do it and it's complicated. But if you're doing it anyway, that means you're in a very great position to apply for us. Uh, because the next step, which is very difficult, is you email us the audit and you tell us what you want to do. And we get an estimate from the audit of the estimated cost for that project. And then basically with that, we sign a funding agreement, which we'll work with Robin. So we'll, we'll collect everything from you and then work with Robin because technically we have to pay the municipality. So our money goes from us to Edmonton and then Edmonton will give it to you when the project's done. Uh, so with that, as soon as Robin signs the paper, you're locked in, you have the funding, uh, we'll hold it for you. And um, then you complete the project. We give a year for people to complete the project, so we'll hold on to the funding for that long. If, if it's taking longer, we do have to give it to you know, whoever is next in line. Um, but if there's you know, reasons why it's delayed, we can work with that. Once the project's complete, we basically just collect invoices and uh, receipts of payment. So that we can, one, because we're giving a percentage of the cost, we need to know what the actual cost was. Uh, so we'll, we'll give you an estimate up front, but we'll give you the real rebate based on what it actually costs. And yeah, then occasionally we have to go and verify the projects. We'll, we audit a couple just to make sure that they're done as they were said. And other than that, we give the funding. So the, the great part about our programs is there's no proposal writing, there's no letters, there's no you don't get accepted or not accepted. If you meet the criteria and you get your audit done and you get everything to us, then that's that. There's no waiting to hear. We'll tell you right away. Um, so that's the efficiency side. I think maybe what I'll do is just keep going. If... Yes, there we go. Okay, so the other program we have is for our solar program. It's a little bit different, but similar structures. So I'll go a touch quicker because I think I'm way over time already. Uh, this is for, again, municipally owned buildings, community leagues, and it's to put solar PV specifically, so not hot water. Um, and we have funding up to $5 million across all of our programs, so quite a bit. And this one is different. We don't have the rule that you can only apply once. So in this case of solar, we'll actually just treat each one of you as an individual project. We'll fire you through as quick as we can. There's no waiting for each other and there's no limits. Um, the only real size caveats we have is we have a minimum size of two kilowatts and that's just because giving away five million dollars two kilowatts at a time is a heck of a lot of work for us to process. So if you have a really good reason why you need a smaller system than that we could probably work with you but as David said that's like a pilot scale project anyway so you'll probably want to do something bigger. And then probably not so applicable but all the way up to one megawatt which is the sort of regulatory limit under the microgen regulation. Um, and our rebate rate is structured uh, according to this table. So what we did when we were designing it is we looked at the cost of systems and we noticed that solar is great because they're pretty similar in price, but the smaller systems are still a little bit more expensive than the big ones. And with our program, we didn't want there to be any unfair advantages. So we were giving away a bit more money to the smaller systems, a uh, medium amount of money to the medium systems and a bit less to the very large ones. Um, Probably most of you will be in the either small or medium. David's, as an example, was 15 for the first half and 15 for the second, so that's kind of right down the middle. And the rebate works that we look at the size of the system and we give you 60 cents per watt for the medium size system or 75 cents per watt uh, of installed capacity. So it's pretty straightforward. If you know how big of a system you're doing, that's the, the, the rebate you'll get. There is a small caveat that it, it can't exceed 20% of the total cost of the system, but the way we designed it, that almost never happens. It's more like if you're right near one of the category cutoffs, or if you get like a really awesome price on your solar panels, in which case um, you're in a pretty good position anyway. The other thing that is noteworthy is just as of two weeks ago, we added a bonus to our program to encourage people to apply faster. So anyone who gets an application in before February 1st of next year will get a bonus 15 cents per watt. So 
that moves you actually closer to about 20 to 25 percent. Um, that's calculated after, so we first figure out what your rebate is, and then we check the 20 percent, then we add the bonus on top. So the bonus doesn't affect kind of your maximum. Um, so as Robin said, that in the case of efficiency, we're covering up to 50 percent. The solar one's a bit less. It's more like 20 to 25. Um, but hopefully that's a pretty decent chunk to take the edge off of uh, your solar project. This one's, uh, this one's even easier. We have an expression of interest, which is even easier. It asks you what your building is, what your name is, roughly what size you're going to do, um, and any other details you know at the time. But this is you're filling out pretty early on a project. So you might, you obviously know which building you're going to put on. And you might have some sense of size, but it's not locking you in. It's more for us to know that you're interested in and we can help you uh, as needed. The second step is the application, which we need a few things to go forward with. So we would need um, enough of a system design that we know the size of the system, the types of panels that are going up, uh, to get a full quote from an installer. We do need a contract with an installer. Uh, and this is because we didn't want to be holding on to funding to projects that don't go forward. So um, you do your expression of interest and then you kind of wait till you have all these things together, then you would apply. And then one of the steps you have to do anyway is to complete a microgen project notice form. Uh, usually the person who's installing your solar panel will just do that for you. It's some paperwork, has a lot of useful information. So rather than us asking you to give it, you know, rewrite all that, we just literally ask for a photocopy of it. Um, and then again, we sign the funding agreement with Robin, you're good to go. You have eight months to complete the project. In this case, a bit faster. Solar is easier to put up. And then again, once you're done, you send us, um, there's a form you get when you've actually connected it to the grid and you're done giving them free energy, as David said. <laughs> once you're there, we get that form and we get your, uh, again, the, the actual cost and proof of payment. And we review it and write the check. And that's that. So it's, it's pretty straightforward and it's, it's almost nothing that you wouldn't have to do anyway. And again, no, no letter writing and no essays or anything like that. It's, uh, if you meet the criteria, you're eligible, that's that. So I think, yeah, thank you. Um, everything that I just said today is on our website. We have web pages you can go to that have the name of the programs. And then there's also PDF documents that have the full real rules. But it's always best just send us an email or give us a call because you are in a bit of a somewhat unique position. Yes. Uh, Mark, if we've received the funding in the past, if we, um, are we still eligible to get it? Yeah, so you're talking about the, the old came. Yeah, so actually some of the people that installed solar back in the day did that through our program. This is brand new. We consider it as a new program, so you're definitely eligible to apply again. Yeah. And the other thing you mentioned, um, project verification. Can you explain that a bit better? Yeah, so we, we do the paper verification first, um, and that's where we're looking at your invoices and your proof of payment to make sure that everything lines up with what we expected. And then we will inspect like some random portion where we'll give you, you know, fair notification that we're going to come out and actually look at the system. We're definitely probably not going to do that on all of them because we, we have three staff members. So uh, as we're dealing with hundreds of these, we're going to do just kind of a sample to make sure. And that would really be more like just actually checking the equipment that everything lines up. It's usually pretty hard to fake the invoices, and we deal with a lot of these, so we'd probably notice pretty quickly. But that's, that's about what it's involved. The, um, we also ask for pictures. Like there, there's a few other small things. Like we ask for a picture that shows the system, and we ask for a bit of public engagement, so some kind of either media release or meeting or event or something to get the community involved as well. Uh, so we would verify that you had done that as well. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, so like I said earlier, EcoCity Edmonton is a program um, that's funded by the City of Edmonton in partner with Alberta EcoTrust. Um, Alberta EcoTrust is an environmental foundation. They've been funding environmental projects for about I think around 25 years in Alberta. So we as the city decided to partner with them because they have a really good track record of providing funding to environmental projects. Um, so our issue priority areas for this fund are energy and climate change. So 
energy efficiency projects, um, renewable energy projects all qualify. But like I said earlier, also projects that are about um, educating the public on these issues also um, would apply to. So if you were um, looking for funding from EcoCity Edmonton, you could put in a little bit more of a comprehensive application than just about infrastructure upgrades for your league. Um, say, for instance, you wanted to tell the story about um, you know, coming to Green Leagues, why you made the decision to do, to do um, these upgrades to your leagues and have a videographer make a nice video that was sort of a bit of a public engagement piece. Those would be the sorts of things that you could also include in an EcoCity Edmonton application as well as applying for some of the more infrastructure-based stuff like the actual solar panels and installations themselves. Um, we have a, a committee of residents from Edmonton that are all sort of involved in the sector that um, adjudicate our grants. And the, the committee are really, really interested in the projects that have a really good education and outreach component to them. So if you put in an application that just looks like infrastructure related funding, they'll be a little less interested just because of the um, sort of the parameters of this fund that we want people to know about issues around energy transition. We want them to become educated and to work towards action. That's sort of really the emphasis of this fund versus something like Mark's program that's really um, based on infrastructure. That doesn't mean though that you can't, um, that you can't put all of these projects together in one sort of larger proposal, like I was saying, where you know, each funder can fund a little bit of each project. Um, we don't fund community gardens or tree planting projects, though, just to let you know, because the city of Edmonton does have funds that do that specifically, like Aaron told us in workshop number one. Um, so we have three different streams for this fund. The largest one um, is up to $50,000. The middle one is up to 20,000. And then we have small community engagement grants that are about $75,000. Um, in the past, the bulk of the money from this fund has actually gone to community leagues. One of the reasons that um, we decided to put on this workshop series was actually because of the number of community leagues that were applying for specifically solar projects through EcoCity Edmonton. And then we had conversations with David and Rocky and it seemed like there was a lot of interest so we thought we'd put together the workshop series. Um, my sense is that most of your community league projects probably fit best into that energy transition acceleration grant category. This is the one where we want sort of more measurable projects, ones that we can look at. Um, what was your percentage decrease in energy use or how many kilowatts of renewable energy are you generating? So we're not going to ask um, for utility bills in quite the same way, but these are the ones that we're looking for more measurable change. Something like the community engagement grants, if you were just interested in doing um, a solar social or something like that, would be a better fit if it was exactly um, sort of education focused. Yes, the community engagement grants, when you said it's kind of like events, the solar socials and stuff, but it's also materials. If they wanted to do a brochure yes. telling the neighborhood about it or a videographer. Right? Yep. And we'll even pay for things like food and stuff for a celebration or eligible costs as well too. Um, there, are, there are few things that EcoCity Edmonton doesn't include as an eligible cost. There are things like alcohol and stuff like that. But they're very different. This grant is very different from a lot of the things that we're talking about today. So it might be the one that you sort of um, have more of that sort of resident engagement piece built into. Not, not to cause a rush of applications for this, but um, you know, we got 75% of our second solar system from this one grant, and then if you if you match that with Mark's stuff, uh, I think there's about 5% left for us to raise. Mm -hmm. So it was that easy to do a 13 kilowatt solar system. The, the only thing I'm going to say about this, though, is unlike um, some of the other grants, like the CLIP grant and um, the grants that Mark were talking about, where they're quite large funds and they're sort of... Uh, CLIP isn't first come, first serve, but it's been quite undersubscribed in the last number of years, like undersubscribed by about a million dollars of what is available versus what has been applied for. 
This fund, we have about $150,000 and we get about $750,000 worth of asks in the last number of years. So just, we want everyone to know sort of about, you know, the likelihood of getting this so is a little bit lower, but, um, <coughs> but it, you can apply for some of those things that aren't necessarily super infrastructure focused. So, um, you know what, I think I'm gonna say that we should take a break now and then come back for Clip. It's the longest grant application that we'll be talking about today. So maybe I'll take, if there are any questions about EcoCity and then we'll go for a break. Good. Between the three, do you have a sense of how many you're subscribed for the community engagement as opposed to the first one, which ones are, are more um, most of them we've been giving to the Energy uh, Transition Acceleration Grants, but like I said, they've had a strong engagement component mirrored with the infrastructure, so it's been sort of both of those. Um, another thing that you could use EcoCity to apply for is for any sort of educational signage in your building. So if you wanted to do one of the energy monitor screens or you wanted to do um, some nice fixed signage that tells all the residents when they come into the building what the upgrades you've done are and what sort of the environmental impacts are. And we at the city can also work with you guys to help create some sort of strong messages. We did that as part of the former community lead program that David was talking about. We created some signage and some messaging. Um, Lisa, who's here as part of our group, has also, she worked at the U of A and they created some really good signage for their buildings too. So we'd be happy to help you guys create some messaging that we think would sort of resonate with the people in your neighborhood too. So for Eco City, you mentioned kind of the maximum dollar amounts. Is yes. there a percent of eligible expenses you guys pay? Yes, yeah, so um, up to 80%, yeah. And um, in that one, we do accept in-kind um, as the other 20%. So in-kind would mean you sort of quantifying your volunteer time that you put in to uh, manage the project or write the grants. Um, also, any money that your league has themselves that you put into it would equal um, the other funds as well too. And the nice thing about putting a little bit of your own funds into the project is they don't have all of these sort of tight criteria of what you can and can't spend it on to. So I would encourage all leagues to put a little bit of their own funding into these projects just um, for those contingency things where it's like, oh, that fund won't pay for this and this fund won't pay for that. It kind of helps you uh, work through those challenges. Robin, the uh, Eco City grant, that will also cover a coordinator? Yes. Some yeah, yeah, so um, because we don't just fund community leagues, we've been working with schools and lots of nonprofit organizations. We've also said that you could apply for a coordinator. So if you needed someone to actually um, put the event on itself, and people have put um, volunteer stipends in there as well too. We recognize that sometimes things don't happen unless someone gets paid to actually coordinate a big event. But again, that should be sort of a smaller percentage of the costs related to the project too. And again, like um, everyone else's, I will send you the link. Uh, EcoCity is an online portal as well too, so I can send you the link to the portal. Our um, deadlines for next year are going to be March the 17th. And then we have a very quick turnover. Usually within two weeks, we let people know if they were successful or not. So a, a lot of these programs, the um, application dates are all at the same time too, which really helps. Except for Mark's one, which you guys can apply as soon as you're ready. Um, so yeah, let's take about 10 minutes for a break and then we'll come back and we'll talk about a few more funding programs. The Community League Infrastructure Program Grant is probably the grant that most of the people who have been involved with leagues for a long time are familiar with. It's the major um, pot of funding that the City of Edmonton has for Community Leagues. And it's intended specifically for upgrades to buildings. Um, one of, the, one of the ways that you initiate the process of applying for the Community League Infrastructure Grant is to talk to your community recreation coordinator. And uh, does everyone in the room know who the community recreation coordinators are or what their job is? Yeah? Um, so there are city staff that are paid to sort of be liaisons between the city and community groups. And each league has one in each of the different quadrants across the city.
So um, CLIP is, like I said, is for infrastructure, but it's not just exclusively for your building, like you heard from David earlier. It can be used for things like basketball and tennis courts, your rink shacks, batting cages, anything that um, is a piece of land or a piece of infrastructure that's on your licensed land. Uh, there are many different things that are eligible for CLIP, such as um, detailed design costs, so engineering drawings, architectural drawings, um, construction and installation costs. But you can see the one that's highlighted here, the um, major fixed mechanical slash electrical equipment required for operation of a facility is probably the sort of category that most of the upgrades that you would be doing to your facility would probably fall under. Um, again, they do include project management. So if you're doing a really large um, renovation project on your league, you can actually hire a professional project manager to help you with that too. But again, the city is probably going to be unlikely to fund that unless your project is over a certain uh, dollar threshold. So um, CLIP has three different categories, um, small awards, which are up to $25,000, the medium ones, which are 25 to 100,000, and then the large awards that are 100,000 to 400,000. And you can see the, the different thresholds that you can only get one of those large ones once every 10 years, which makes sense to, to spread the money around. Um, when we were talking to the CLIP coordinators about this program and letting them know that we were doing it and we were presenting information. Um, they wanted us to mention that um, a number of years ago, I think it was in 2008 or 10, I can't remember, 2010, the city of Edmonton paid um, Stantec to do um, building condition assessment reports for every single league building in the city. So some of you will be really aware of those Stantec reports and some of you won't be. I actually have all of them. So if anyone doesn't have theirs for the league, I know, you know, 2010 is eons ago in community leagues. So you've had lots of turnover. So if you would like access to your building condition report, let me know and I'll send it to you. I've also sent them to the consultants. So before they even go into your building, they know a number of years ago, here were some of the, um, the issues that were sort of flagged and some of the upgrades that Stantec had recommended actually happen to your building. So again, um, I think it, a good outcome of this would be that everyone is sort of aware of their Stantec report. Because I think we have to be cognizant too, if you're applying for CLIP funds for energy efficiency or especially for solar, if you haven't addressed a major concern in your CLIP report, like you have a crumbling foundation, the likelihood of them paying for your solar system is a lot lower. But if after that report, you know, you went through and did routine maintenance on a lot of the things that were mentioned, then, um, then they'll be more likely to fund something. Or like David said, you know, if you're bundling it as part of a larger package, your roof needs to be replaced. So you're going to add solar as a really nice logical one and it would actually reduce the price per watt of your solar system because it's bundled together with that roof replacement at the same time. Um, we were trying to get our lights, our LED lights, but the Santec report said our lighting system was outdated at past its life expectancy anyway. Mm -hmm. So it was rationalized right in the Santec report. Yes, so it, and um, in the CLIP grant applications, I have a few of them here that I can pass out to anyone who's interested in having a look. There is even a, a little box that you tick off that says that you've done another type of assessment report. So that's where you could attach um, the energy audit that you have to. And so because those Stantec reports are getting a little bit old too, um, I think they'd be happy to see that you've done an energy audit and that you've done some prioritization of projects as well too, but be sure to attach that so the administrators can see um, what the ener energy auditors said as well. Because these building assessment reports were a little, they're different than an energy audit. They're about you know whole building systems, foundation, roof, all of that stuff. But I think they would still, um, it will improve your chances of being funded by them seeing this energy audit. So don't just put in the contractor quotes and leave out um, the audit documentation. Um, likewise with the solar assessments too. Yeah. Uh, first of all, are we able to get this one what we applied for, especially like the 10 year one? I don't know the back. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
if you, you know what, in the contact information that I'll send out, we're gonna send out a list of all of the presenters and useful contacts. I can put the CLIP grant administrator's contact in there and then you can get in touch with them and they'll let you know your league's history. They'll have a file for each league. But I, I went through a few of those Stantec reports just out of interest sake too and they're, um, I think they provide a really good amount of information to you as well too. So if you haven't looked at it and you're on your, your league's um, building committee too, it might be nice to have a, have a look. Some of them, I think, are the basis for some groups deciding that they need a new league building too, if you had too many fundamental flaws. Um, one of the things that, that, uh, that we glean from our Stanchek report is that there's actually a, a fairly well-defined way of, of assessing your building. Mm -hmm. And it also is, is rich with information in terms of how long your building components are intended to last. Mm -hmm. And, and I think uh, a really, uh, that's a really important resource for um, deciding on what your uh, efficiency or, or sustainability mm -hmm. project is going, timeline is going to look like by, by aligning those expected useful lives and when you're going to need to be replacing things with, with entry points for right. where you're going to make your, your improvements. And especially, yeah, exactly. And especially when we were talking to the CLIP administrators, they recognize that energy efficiency upgrades and retrofits are general building upgrades and retrofits too. Their focus may not be quite the same as ours, which is on efficiency, but they're, they realize that these things are sort of intrinsically tied too. Nora, do you want to come up and give a quick overview of the... Oh, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm just here to talk a little bit about the uh, NMAX Award. So NMAX has been one of the EFCL sponsors occasionally for various things that we do throughout the year. They support different types of things that we've been doing. And we, we started this workshop series. I sort of let them know about it and they wanted to um, support communities um, in whatever way they could. And so we've decided that um, they're going to offer a $15,000 um, award for community leagues that have come out and are gone to the Green Leagues workshops, learned a little bit about it, you guys got a project together, so that will be drawn. So that award um, tonight, we're gonna give you some information on. So these are the application forms here. I can also send you a digital copy if you like. Um, what you need to know about that in order to submit it, you have to have been to one of these Green League workshops. Um, the deadline is February the 1st of this year, 2017. They want you to be able to have actually have a project going and be able to spend the money by 2017. Um, the application form um, basically just asks questions like, um, what is your project? Um, show what kind of energy efficiency upgrades you're gonna be able to do, what kind of savings you're gonna be able to do. It asks, um, what your budget is, simple things like you were saying, name, community contact information. Um, and then, as Robin was mentioning earlier, it asks for two quotes. So it's a pretty simple application form. Um, so all the ones that can show us that they have a, a project ready to go, that have that in by February 1st, from those, if we get five or six or 10, then we'll just do a random draw from that, and somebody will get $15,000, which they'll be able to then use as matching towards some of these other programs. So that's pretty exciting. Make sure you get that information. Um, the other thing we have here, like Robin was saying, we're going to some materials before. Here's sort of an example of a bunch of general grants. We'll be sending out a, um, information afterwards of all types of different grants that you can get, including our programs. Anything else you to talk about? No, no, that's everything. Okay. Yeah, this one's pretty cool that MX created this just as part of our program. So again, the you know the odds are pretty decent and I think the application's probably the most simple of any of the programs out there too. The provincial government, as part of the carbon levy funding, is creating an agency that they're calling Energy Efficiency Alberta. Um, and Mark actually right now is on a panel. They chose a panel of Edmontoni, or not at the, at Albertans, and one Nova Scotian to sort of advise the government on what exactly energy uh, efficiency Alberta should look like 
and what it should do. But the things that we do know about this agency is they are going to have programs that are gonna start in January 2017. Um, in the legislation that was passed, it said they're going to have $645 million over five years to spend on energy efficiency projects. So you can see, compared to anything else we've talked about, this fund is massive compared to anything that's um, been available in Alberta to date. And I, you guys may remember the slide of North America and how they were saying there were no energy efficiency incentives in Alberta. There are now, and these are them. So this one's a bit funny because I can't tell you what those uh, projects will look like because we don't know yet. But they have promised us as the city of Edmonton that they will be publicly available in January. So what I'm committed to doing is, um, as soon as those are launched, to making sure that you guys all get an email that explains um, the type of funding that will be available. So they have said they will have programs specific for nonprofits and specific for commercial buildings, which community leagues would probably fall into as well too. And so um, I think they will probably work very similarly to a lot of the other projects you've heard, where they would want you to do an audit in advance um, the provincial government wasn't able to say conclusively, but I did call them to say um, the energy audits that you guys will have done are called ASHRAE Level 2 audits. And I asked them, um, do they think that this program would have a higher requirement than that? And they said, no, that would be highly unlikely. So we're still trying to set you up um, to be well aligned to apply for these programs when they um, hit the road in January 20. 2017 and the nice thing will be I think Brandon and Jeremy and other people in the room are going to be really busy as soon as January hits so it'll be nice that a number of leagues will have their audits done before um, this whole market sort of explodes so we're expecting that they'll have energy efficiency and potentially even some solar incentive programs but again I don't know what those will look like exactly other than there's going to be quite um, quite a bit of money available and we'll do our best to get that information out to you. But at least the timing aligns quite well. If CLIP and other funds are due in, in March, you'll know about these well, well before that deadline. So again, you can start stacking all of those things together. Is there anything to add, Mark? I guess the only thing I would add is uh, January 1st is when they come into existence. So right now this agency doesn't exist aside from it has a name and uh, a budget. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they're between now and January first they have to get a board, get a CEO, get staff, get a building, start designing programs, start launching and start doing outreach. So we're trying to warn people, okay, January first there's probably going to be something. It might not be the something that you need, it might be something somebody else needs, but this is it's going to continue growing, especially um, so six six hundred and forty five million over five years. Year one is forty five million and then it grows to about 130 per year. So if there isn't a program for you on January 1st, there definitely will be something that you can use. It just, it might be in like the second program that comes out or the third, because this, this agency is gonna get built up and start trying to launch, you know, all sorts of different things for different groups of people. And so um, be patient and keep, keep watching them because it's very likely that new stuff will be coming out all the time, or especially in the first two or three years, because they have to grow from nothing to something pretty big, pretty quickly. But I, I think for us who have been working in this sector for a long time, we realize that this represents some really big change. There's been nothing of this sort of scope available to Albertans at any point in time. So I think the, the timing of our program, we, when we thought about doing these workshops, we had no idea about any of this. So it's been sort of falling in line really nicely, which is good. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about was a little bit about crowdfunding and how leagues could potentially use that to fill in some of those gaps of what, uh, what funders won't pay for. So crowdfunding is using, these are a bunch of names of the different platforms that you can use. They're web-based programs where people in your um, neighborhood could go and pledge money towards a project. So usually um, to be successful, you have to do something like create a short little, it doesn't have to be polished or anything, but a short little video that talks about your program, what some of the benefits would be. A nice, um, just a written story and some photos also work really well too. 
I myself have used Fundraiser for a project that I'm working on, and we were able to raise quite a bit of money for Edmontonians to start. Um, we're starting a tool lending library. So again, this would be a way to get funds from um, people in your neighborhood contributing to these projects. And I know community leagues have always done stuff like this. They've always done fundraisers. This is just sort of a, a newer platform that people have been using that makes it really easy for people to pay for those. So you just go in, put your pledge, put your credit card number in, and it happens really quickly. Um, and they, most of them do charge a small administrative fund, though. So make sure you know what that is before you, you intend. But I think the fundraiser one that we used was less than 5%, which is more around 2 which is less than um, what credit card companies would charge you for processing, too. And so I know that um, there are a bunch of community-based organizations in Edmonton that use crowdfunding really successfully for their projects. And again, it's just another way to get people in your neighborhood, if they're really excited about something you're doing, you know, they could give as little as $5 towards your project. But $5, the number of times, really adds up. I routinely give about you know, $20 a week to a different a different project that comes up through crowdfunding platforms. And it's neat to sort of see the donations come in and sort of amass to something. And again, these are the dollars that aren't tied to, you have to use it for this, you can't use it for this. These can kind of fill in the gaps in your proposal. Um, so this was gonna be the point where we were going to draw for the services, but we don't actually have 15 applications. So. Everybody who um, put in either a letter or a check has actually um, won the services tonight. And then we have a few other leagues I know that they weren't able to get their letters in on time. So we're going to give you guys uh, another week or two to have those in too. But if you're talking to other, other friends and other leagues too, and if they're interested, let me know. Because we as the city had set aside um, enough subsidy for 15 projects too. And I think we'll probably get close to reaching that threshold with people who have participated. Um, I will, in the last email that I sent to everyone, I'll remind them that they were committed to these services and will um, ask you for those $1,000 checks from your league for whatever service that you ask for. And then we'll connect you again with all of the um, service providers like Generate Energy and the Solar Power Investment Co-op so that you guys will be matched up. Does anyone have any questions about anything? So are you going to mention the names of the leagues in there? Yeah, Nora has a listener. Oh, it's probably easier to read that. Oh, right, sure. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, so we have Parkdale, Cromdale, Malmo, and Burnwood. Yeah, and then Burnwood and Parkdale, Cromdale again. And then I think, who are the other ones? Mm -hmm. Connie, what league are you from? Uh, and then Forest Terrace Heights. Oh, sorry. Okay, and we have Athlone Community League. And then what was uh, the name? Grosvenor. And Grosvenor as well. Oh, okay. Sorry, people were supposed to be asked when they came in. And I'm from Westmount, but I'm just kind of like a, a sub for someone who's out of town and couldn't make it ah, tonight. Ah, okay. So I'm not too sure what's going on with that. I'm sure they would be interested. Sure. Well, if you guys are, like I said, for the leagues, for some people I understand treasurers and people were out of town and they weren't able to get these. So I will include all those instructions in my follow-up email to the leagues saying, you know, you have this many weeks to follow up. And again, if anyone else, um, I know there are a few other leagues who weren't sure. If you're interested, come and talk to me after and we can explore more about whether it's a good fit. Um, I'm just curious about your deadline. If you could uh, push that into November, because there's a lot of community leagues that have their meetings at the end of the month. Oh, okay, so they've missed their meeting already. Sure. Or the meeting will be coming up, so yeah. <coughs> that would help. The case that would help. Yeah. Perhaps what we could do is just say that um, once I count out the remainder, just say we have this many remaining, it's a first come first serve basis for people who get it. Because I think you can see we still have a number of them left for the people who participated. Does that work? Yeah, okay. Just so everyone can meet their deadlines. All right, um, this is the point in time where we need some feedback from you guys again. So I have um, some flip chart paper and some markers up here. 
And again, we wanted you guys to think about, so if, if EFCL had a full-time sustainability-related staff person, which is the proposal that has come to us as the city, um, how could this person help you in establishing a sustainability program in your league if you don't have one already? Um, what are some of the resources, the tools, and the assistance that they could help you with that would help make projects a success? Um, and also, what are some of the sustainability issues you'd like to learn more about? Because uh, another part of this person's job could potentially be planning a workshop series like this again. And so if you could identify some of the remaining things that you'd still like to know about. Um, I'll put one out there that a, a number of people have talked to me about. Is there a few leagues in the room that are building new buildings? So they're really curious about, um, could we hold a workshop on what, what are the components of a sustainable building? How do you hire contractors? What are the questions that you would ask? Which in some cases will be similar to some of the things that we've covered, but there's a whole other world out there of you know, material selection and things like that. So that's one potential idea just to kind of get you thinking. Um, I think maybe groups of four, does that seem like it would work? Can I maybe get, uh, each group just to share one of the things that they had written down about uh, the questions. You guys are talking about lights. I need lights for my like, what community, you guys? Grover. Grover, just so I know. Yeah. <laughs> but, Come on down. but I don't know anything about that. And I don't want to learn about that. I'm busy enough. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, so I want, I want the person who is the sustainability director here to be the person that directs activities. I don't even mind if they act like a general contractor and money goes back to EFCL for my community to have that person perform that role if we're using them. Right. Yeah. I, I just had an idea. That was a really cool comment. Uh, have, have any, have Which any, one? The lights? Well, oh, <laughs> I need lights too. That's yeah. what I was thinking, right? Yeah. Um, is there any interest or, or thought been put in, in sort of um, aggregating our buying power? Yeah, absolutely. That'd be a great idea. Yeah. yeah. And along those lines, like, you know, we all have very similar, you know, lights. We need lights too. You know, <laughs> you know, and, you know instead of a, an outreach coordinator, but someone who actually has that industry experience or someone in the LED, you know, they, they've done it before. If we had someone like that, that's a road source. Mm -hmm. you know, leads out or them. could help negotiate contracts on yeah. dollar amounts yeah. or something. Yeah. Um, like to, in, along that same lines, so for example, if we're talking about rink lights, and that's not the only thing obviously, but if you have a person that um, puts out an email and says, this is, I've got a company and this is, this is what they're rated at, this yeah. is what we would do, this is our buying power, we have until, we have seven months from now to make a commitment. So if they were like project of the month kind of thing, would be a great way, because I, I have a hard enough time getting my maintenance people to get work done, it'd be nice if it was pushed down and, and options were given. Does one of the other groups want to share something? Yeah, we talked about uh, someone who's able to help create a sort of guidebook for promoting sustainability within the community. So it goes beyond just the need and then just go to the level. Kind of a program guide. Right. Here's the program. You need to do, here's the program. We follow this here. We put on these activities. Who wants to participate? We're going to have those five, I don't know, five power deliverables this year. You know, each year kind of run a, a program that you know, people can follow easily without. I think the hardest thing is always getting resources and people putting their time to care. Right. Um, new building construction best practices for something that we like to learn more about. And also, um, it would, if the sustainability coordinator ended up being a, a collection of experiences from all the leagues, so if a league was doing a project and they don't know about a league across the city that ran into that same issue, but that sustainability coordinator can say, oh, you know, either connect them or just be that resource for that information. 
Yeah, I think related to that, I think we find even just within our own communities, league boards, that we don't have enough information sharing year to year. And, and not just around energy, about a lot of things. And, um, That's why I wanted so, to share the Stantec report and stuff, just in case someone didn't know they existed. So, yeah, so I, I think that's a little bit about how we can transition our own boards and be more efficient with that. But this meeting right here, you know, I might not be on the board next year, and I would might be want to send another, or our league might want to send another person. So, recurring of these workshops, I think, is very vital that keep the steam going because there's a turnover on boards. Right. So. Yes, and continuity. Yeah. Um, one of the things our, our group came up with was um, a help with visioning. Mm -hmm. um, in the sense that, that that's actually a pretty important and, and potentially difficult skill set that I don't think a lot of boards have to say, okay, well, what does this board sustainability actually mean? In our what are going to be our guiding principles to, to help us know whether we're on course or whether we're not. Whether it's the same vision for the whole city or, or, or our, our vision or the league. I think we have to start, all of us, I think we have to make sure we don't start our process in the wrong place. Right? Um, you know, we were talking about this earlier, you know, uh, well, yeah, we, we upgraded our windows. Um, because you know that's a really good idea, only to find out that actually uh, we've got a really great solar resource. We our building could actually go net zero, but now we're going to have a hard time affording it because we spent all this money on windows that aren't actually as good as they would need to be to get us to go that far. For example, yeah, it's an extreme example. I agree, but the idea of, of not only getting the sequencing right, but make sure we start in the right place in, in the first place. Right? I think. These, this is all really valuable feedback because um, if the proposal is funded, we'll be looking to create a job posting really soon. So all of this can feed into the roles and responsibilities of what that person will actually do. Um, <laughs> he's shaking his head. So, <laughs> so that brings us to eight o'clock and the end of the workshop.